Today, I want you to know that there is no condemnation in Jesus Christ. How do you live your life? Do you feel condemned a lot of the time? Feel like you're always falling short? That you're not <clears throat> meeting up to the um, criteria? or the standard of Jesus Christ. I hope today that the word that I'm gonna bring you is the word of the gospel, which is good news, that you can be set free from that. I wanna to read to you in um, John, the story of the woman caught in the very act of adultery. And let's look at this story, and let's look at condemnation and how Jesus treated her. In John 8, Chapter 8, verses 3 through 11. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. What was Jesus writing in the dirt or on the ground? Let me remind you that this took place outside the temple. <clears throat> More than likely that it was a paved or stoned courtyard. So we see Jesus bending down and writing on the stone. When was the last time, <clears throat> excuse me, or when was another time that you know that the finger of God wrote on stone? Well, it would have been the Ten Commandments. So could it have been that Jesus was tracing on the stone the commandment which said, this is in Deuteronomy 22, verses 22 through 24, the man who commits adultery with another man's wife he who commits adultery with his neighbors, the adulterer and the adulteress, shall surely be put to death. So was Jesus writing that scripture? Because if she was caught in the very act of adultery, there had to be a man involved. It is my understanding that it takes two to commit adultery, not just one. So they didn't catch the man or they weren't going to accuse the man. They were only going to accuse the woman. Which makes me wonder, was this some man that was high, upstanding in the synagogue that they didn't dare bring an accusation against, but they let him go, but they wanted to catch the woman because somebody had to pay. Somebody had to give something up because of this terrible thing that was uh, committed. So the scripture goes on. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. So who in that group could cast a stone? Who in that group was without sin? There was only one person, and that was Jesus Christ. And yet, that's not the action he took. And so the scripture goes on. And again, he stoops down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. Did Jesus possibly, then when he stooped down again and wrote on the ground, maybe he was writing the names or name of the man she was with. Maybe this wasn't the only man that she had committed adultery. Now I'm supposing here nothing is said in scripture. She was caught this one time, so we don't know. But what if she had been with other men? And what if Jesus was writing their names on the ground in the dirt so that they were aware he knew, and then they knew that he knew? And so, so one by one, they drop their stones and they walk away. And then it says, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Imagine this. Imagine this, that you've not only committed a sin, but you've been caught. And now you're standing there with Jesus. What do you think Jesus is going to do or say? 
Are you afraid? Are you feeling awful and, and condemned and uh, nervous and guilty? All those things going through your head, through your heart, through your emotions, knowing particularly that you could be killed for this, what you've done. And yet, what does Jesus say? <laughs> when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Jesus had every right to condemn her. She was caught in the act of breaking the law, the law that said they could be stoned. And yet Jesus turned the law back on those who were accusing her to say, who of you is without sin? They were trying to trap Jesus, but Jesus wouldn't, couldn't be trapped because they were trying to trap the word with the word. <laughs> they couldn't do it. But let's also point out right here, Jesus was not tolerant of what she did. Because if he was tolerant of her and it was okay, he wouldn't have told her to go and sin no more. So he wasn't tolerant. It wasn't okay for her to commit adultery. But he condemned her, releasing her because of no condemnation that she was free to go and sin no more. <clears throat> I have made comments before in some of my other teachings saying that grace is an empowerment. But grace is not an empowerment. Grace is favor, undeserved favor. But the power of condemnation and no condemnation enables us not to sin. There are many time, times that we as Christians cannot receive, let me rephrase that, will not receive an answer to our prayer because we believe we are undeserving, undeserving because we've committed some sin in the past. And so we believe that we're not receiving a healing or we're not receiving an answer to a prayer, whatever it may be. We may not be receiving financial assistance or the financial situation going away because of something we've done in our past. It's, it's kind of in our nature. Remember the story of the, uh, the young man who was blind? And so everybody was caught up. Who sinned, this young man or his parents? And they were all caught up that the, re the blindness was a result or a payment a payback for some great sin that had been committed. And so Jesus did not condemn her. Can you truly believe? Can you truly understand that if you were alone with Jesus and you were standing there, and let's say that everything that you knew you've ever did wrong was like hanging or was like tattooed across you or like a neon sign fly, you know, flashing, flashing, flashing that Jesus wouldn't condemn you. Can you believe that? There's a story in the, in the scriptures of the woman who came and she um, had, was a harlot, I believe, as the story goes. And yet Jesus forgave her. And then Jesus told the story about the man who owed the king like $100,000 and then the, that man was forgiven but then he goes out and somebody owes him $20 and he throws the $20 guy in prison. Well, then it turns out that the 100,000 guys put in prison because the king said, did I not forgive you? Could you not be that generous with someone else? And so the parable, the, the moral of that parable, so he that is forgiven much loves much. So you see, when we understand how much that we have been forgiven, how much that Jesus loves us, it actually can change us that then we're able to love others. When I'm condemned, I want to come down on others because I want them to feel the same thing I'm feeling. But when I've been overwhelmed by the love of God, that he does not condemn me, but forgives me and washes me clean, then I can grant that same forgiveness to other people because I have been loved much I can turn around and love much in return. 
So let's go to another, comparing that story of no condemnation, let's go look at another story in the scriptures. If you were to say, uh, what do you think was the worst sin in the Bible, what would that be? Well, I don't know that we can compare one sin to another. Sin is sin. But let's just say that the greatest sin, which if I were categorizing them, I would say this was it, was Adam and Eve. When they gave away the garden, when they gave away the earth, when they gave away mankind to Satan, that was a pretty big one. But let's go look at that story. We're in Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. And Adam and Eve, let me set this up for you, they've already taken of the fruit, they've already eaten, and they have uh, made fig leaves for themselves to cover themselves. They've gone to the work of their hands, they've gone to, uh, to works to cover themselves, which only God could do. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you not eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Now, isn't this interesting? God is omniscient, so he knows everything. So he knew that Adam and Eve had sinned. He knew that they had fallen short. You know, Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, Adam and Eve, before that time, had not sinned, did not have a sin nature. So the, I believe the reason that they did not know they were naked was because they were clothed in the glory of God. So then when they sinned and that glory of God came off of them because now they were fallen, it was revealed to them what they were. Shame came, guilt came, condemnation came upon them. And so then they tried to make it all good by putting fig leaves on to cover themselves. And God had to go and killed an animal and covered them with skins, the blood of animals. Because the word says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So he killed the animals, put those bloody skins on them, covered them in that blood so that their sins were covered. Now we are blessed to live under the new covenant because our sins are not covered by the blood of Jesus. Our sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus. In the old covenant, it was the blood of bulls and goats that covered sin and, and covered that for, for a time. But when Jesus came and shed his blood, his blood washed away our sins that it is no longer there. So isn't it interesting that when Adam and Eve have, have committed this horrendous sin that is going to affect every man who will ever live from that time on, that God came and he said, where are you? Where are you? Can you believe that when you commit sin that God is not condemning you, that he might come and say, where are you? And what should our response be? Our response should be, because that's a location question, where are you? I am in the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been bought with a price. My sin has been washed away by the blood of the Lamb. That's where I am. It is not that I'm a Christian with eternal life and then I sin and, oh, I'm not a Christian and I don't have eternal life anymore. I, I confess and, and repent and I come, I'm now a Christian again and I have eternal life. Oh, I sin and I'm, I'm not a Christian and I don't have eternal life anymore. No. Even when I've missed the mark of the high calling of the Lord Jesus Christ, even when I've sinned, I'm still in Christ Jesus. Praise God that he gives us, to, gives us that. Then what is the second question that God asks? He didn't say, what did you do? Like Jesus, when it was just him and the woman, he didn't say, well, is it true what they said? He didn't confront her like that. And so what is the second thing that God says? He says, who told you you were naked? Is that not like the same question that, the, that Jesus asked the woman, where are those accusers of yours? And God said, who told you you were naked? Couldn't that have been an accusation? Oh, look what you did. And oh, look what you are now, you're naked. 
an ac accusation. Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. He wants to hold in front of you all the time all the things you've done, how you've fallen short, how you've disappointed the Lord, how you have disgraced the name of Christ, how you've lost it. But you know what? It is not about us and what we've done, but it's of what Jesus Christ has done. So I love that when he said, who told you you were naked? And then let's look at God as he really is, not as a hateful, uh, destructive God, but let's look at God now as a God of salvation, as a God who took all his wrath out upon Jesus Christ for every sin that ever was committed or will ever be committed, it was put on Jesus Christ and the punishment was meted out at the cross. Jesus was the body of the sacrifice left to take on the judgment of God, whereas all the other sacrifices of blood, and, of, blood of bulls and goats, that the, sacrifice, the, the judgment was greater than the sacrifice. So then when the priest went in, it, it, the, the fire of God and the judgment of God destroyed the, the uh, body of that animal and the blood was taken. But when Jesus Christ was there, his body was left because his sacrifice was greater than the judgment of God. Don't you love that? And so then God put Adam and Eve out of the garden because, yes, they did eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which he had told them not to. But it was in his goodness that God did that because he wanted them out of the garden before they could partake of the tree of life. Because had they taken of the tree of life after they had eaten the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in their fallen state, then they would have had eternal life fallen. But God took them out of there to protect them because he had a way, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. Romans 8, 1 and 2 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And then verse 2 says, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Let's read 2 Corinthians 3, verses 7 through 12. In the, this is in the New Living Translation. The old way with laws etched in stone, which was what? The Ten Commandments. Led to death. Though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face, for his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading away. Shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way, now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? If the old way, which brings condemnation, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way, which makes us right with God? In fact, that first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way, which has been replaced, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new, which remains forever? Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. Bold in what? Bold in what I say. Bold in what I believe. So I'm bold because even when I miss the mark, I can still say that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I can say I may have sinned, but I still believe and declare that I am in Christ Jesus, not because of what I've done, because of what he has done, that he has made me accepted in the beloved. Did he not make us accepted in the beloved when we were great sinners before we ever came to Christ? Didn't he make us accepted in the beloved? Yes, he did. And he keeps us there. And Romans 5, 17 says, For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all, excuse me, for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. In the New Living Translation, Romans 5, 17. 
1 John 3, 21 says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. Condemnation will paralyze us. It will paralyze our relationship with God from our standpoint, not from God's standpoint, but from our standpoint. It will paralyze our faith. It will paralyze our prayer life. Because you see, too many times we believe that God answers our prayer. He heals us. He provides for us only if we've done everything properly. And if we've missed it, if we haven't done anything properly, I dare not come to God and ask. Really? That's the best time to come and ask because I realize it's not me, but it's because of him, the wonderful, loving, heavenly father, who our elder brother, the Lord Jesus Christ, gave his sacrifice, which was accepted that he is not going to condemn us, but he's going to accept us. Now, that doesn't mean he's not going to convict us because he wants us to change. Then he empowers us to change. He cleanses us. Our mind is renewed. The word says, be saved. The word does not say, be saved and you'll be transformed. The word says, renew your mind and you'll be transformed. We have to stop aligning our thoughts with the accuser of the brethren. Um, our thoughts, listen to this, our thoughts, which is what we believe, then if we believe it, then it's what we'll speak and it's what we will do. We cannot align those up with the accuser. We've got to let our thoughts line up with the word of God, with what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. In Luke 10, 18, it says that um, Jesus saw Satan fall like lightning from the sky. And in Revelation 10, uh, 12, 10, it says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. That's not a futuristic statement. That is a statement of already that's happened because Jesus said he saw Satan fall like lightning. Do you believe the kingdom of God has come? Yes. The kingdom is not in uh, food or drink, but in righteousness, peace, and joy. The kingdom of God is, has come. So that is a present statement. And the accuser of the brethren has already been cast out, but we can't agree with him. Luke 6, 36 and 37 says, Therefore be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. You know, we read that scripture, and we think that that's telling us about others, and it is, but it's also telling us about ourselves. Be merciful to yourself. Don't condemn yourself. Forgive yourself and love yourself. Receive what God has done. We must be merciful to others, but we've got to be merciful to us. We're not to condemn the other members of the body of Christ. We are a member of the body of Christ. We can't condemn ourselves. We must receive the cleansing that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ has brought to us and walk in that. I am in Christ so I am a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I may have been a sinner and done this or that, but I'm a new creation. I can speak with boldness that we talked about and read about earlier, that I am accepted in the beloved, even when I've done badly, even when I have sinned. You know, the uh, scripture uh, in Romans 8, 2, it says, um, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And then it goes on to say, who walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. Um, I've heard that that said that that phrase, that walk after the spirit, not after the flesh, was added by the translators, that it's not in the original Greek. Let's even go back to the story of the woman caught in the act of adultery. Don't you think that she was walking after flesh to be committing adultery? And yet Jesus did not condemn her. Condemnation is not in him. Love and forgiveness is in him. When is there no condemnation? Now. Now 
is the time that there is no condemnation. Not when you've done everything perfectly, but there is no condemnation now, today, no matter what you're in, the love of Christ is shed abroad in our hearts, the word says. I'm accepted in the beloved, Ephesians 1, 6 says. I am seated together with him in heavenly places, Ephesians 2, 6 says. I'm seated and I stay in that seat. I'm not seated and falling and seated and falling and seated and falling. I am seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. So when I've made a wrong turn, when I'm running late, when I've spent more, when I've been depressed, when I've been stressed, when I've been spoken words in anger, when I've done all those things, I receive no condemnation, but I receive the love and the forgiveness and the cleansing of the Lord Jesus Christ because I am a new creation, because I am seated in heavenly places, because I am accepted in the beloved. So whenever God might come to me and say, where are you? I can say, I am in Christ Jesus. Beloved, let there be no condemnation in your life today. Stop it cold. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you where the accuser stands over you and accuses you. And let that be exposed so that you can reject what he's saying and receive the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. Mm -hmm.